Hey everyone. Uh, we'll give it a minute or two for people to dial in. Uh, looks like we're going to have a full house with speakers today. I see Vicky's on the line. Uh, we've got Amanda and her team from Open UK. And I see Jerry's also uh, on the line to potentially talk about some of his experience uh, around Cisco and so on. Are you good to talk today or do you want to talk another day, Jerry? Uh, I haven't prepared anything, so um, I think- We can do it next time. Yeah, yeah, we can do, you know, maybe next time. All right, that's cool. That gives us a, a lead on October, first Monday. Yeah. No, not October. What month is it? It's uh, August. It's been one of those years. <laughs> we should cancel 2020. We should. So we'll open with Vicky and then we'll move on to the Open UK team. So the, the format here today is basically talking about experience and lessons learned, and then moving on to the discussion of future leaders. Uh, we have approximately an hour for the whole deal. Uh, that doesn't mean we have to use the entire hour. One of the main things would be to keep everything nice and uh, conversational. People can dive in at any point. One way to look at the Open Chain webinars is that it's like a radio show where all of the audience is already dialed in. So you know, don't hesitate to ask questions, provide commentary, whatever. What we're in here now is a situation where this is replacing both our conference talks and our hallway tracks at the same time. So we should make the most of each of these uh, sessions. I see, uh, yeah, I just had some notes there from our previous meeting. We had a partner meeting immediately previous to this and uh, some people had some network issues. Thankfully, on, oh my goodness me, I see a Madison is on the line. That makes two of us at 1 a.m. here in Japan. Hi, Madison. Yeah, hi. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm working at home since March, so I'm a little, little more flexible in my time, so. I can join the midnight call. <laughs> it's, it's good to have you here. Wow, that's dedication. Uh, so I actually, one interesting thing about working from home is there was announcements from American companies like Twitter that everyone can work from home forever. But just today, there was an announcement from Fujitsu where they did the same. And they said they're closing down half of their office space which is so weird for a Japanese company. Okay, we're two minutes into the call. Uh, everyone, welcome to webinar seven for the Open Chain Project. We've got these webinars running on a bi-weekly schedule. We've been doing it since April, and we've had pretty good feedback. Open Chain is a very global community. This call is technically for the US, Europe side of things. Uh, in Asia, most of us are in bed for a long time at this stage. But this call is being recorded and will be shared with the Asian team. So work groups in China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan will be reviewing what we do. And hopefully they might provide some feedback as well. Past speakers have inspired other speakers and that's been great. Um, just to open up today, we're gonna start with Vicky and we're gonna do kind of just a, a conversational talk. Um, and the idea here is just to explore some of the lessons learned. We've had similar talks from people like um, Jeff, who set up Palomita on the tooling side of things. And I thought what would be cool with Vicky is to talk through some of the work that uh, she's done in terms of linking corporate interests, business activity, and open source in a productive way. Uh, because ultimately, the Open Chain project is primarily focused on business activity. And one of the key things we try to do is to talk through how open source fits into business strategic planning. I mean, our emphasis is compliance, but naturally open source is in truth critical to every aspect of business. If you've got a platform, it's probably open source. Um, so Vicky, I was wondering if you could do a, a brief intro of yourself, let people know who you are, and then we'll shift into the discussion gear. All right. Um, 
Well, hi, everyone. And Shane um, and Imada-san, I really appreciate that you're up at this incredibly ungodly hour. Um, that's dedication. To, so kudos to both of you. Um, so I am VM Brasor, but uh, because we're all friends here, you can call me Vicky. I am based in Portland, Oregon, where it is lovely and gray. So we're totally on brand here in Portland this morning. Um, I am a corporate open source strategist. I help companies be uh, more successful by releasing, using, and contributing to free and open source software in a way that's both good for their bottom line, which they think they're good at, but they're not usually, and for the community, which they're usually not so good at. So um, I uh, have done a fair bit of freelance work helping companies do that. Um, recently, I was I had dropped freelance to enter a monogamous relationship with Juniper Networks. Um, they then cut their entire open source team. So I am now looking to join another company. Maybe that's with you. Who knows? Um, so um, I can set up open source program offices. I help with compliance. I help with, uh, you know, what are you going to release and why? Uh, and that's actually the one thing I've learned across almost every single company I've worked with is a question nobody bothers to ask, let alone answer, um, which is why do you want, why are you doing this in the first place? What are you hoping to get out of it? Because if you don't know that, you're not going to really get the benefits you think you're going to get out of free and open source software and releasing it and using it and all that sort of stuff. Those are, the using is easy, right? Um, you can see the benefits there because you can uh, use libraries that you didn't have to develop yourself and voila. Um, of course, that doesn't take total cost of ownership into, uh, into account. That doesn't take compliance. That doesn't take security. So, you know, it really is free like free puppy when you get free and open source software. And that's something that I think a lot of companies lost perspective on. Um, we kind of screwed up in the 90s and early 2000s by not doing a good job of communicating these things We in free and open source software. A lot of that was helped by the corporate FUD that was spread around about free software in particular, and then open source came on the scene theoretically to make it more, uh, more business friendly, but um, the bad habits around and perceptions around free software kind of overshadowed open source, I think, for a long time from the business perspective. So they didn't understand, you know, yes, you can get all these benefits, but you do have to put some work in in order to do it right. Uh, so that is actually something that I discovered. I wasn't given a lot of uh, direction as far as what to speak about here. So oh, yeah. I did end up writing a whole bunch of notes that I think might become a blog post because uh, <laughs> it turns out I have some thoughts and well, opinions around this. One thing I wanted to kick off with was, you know, a lot of companies now they're fine with using open source, but there's a pretty hard wall on exactly something that you literally wrote the book on contributions to open source. And, um, I think it's the only full book on this topic, if I recall It is correctly. the only book in existence about how to contribute to open source software. And it's interesting because, you know, the, let's say the open chain specification for compliance, we explain how to address software and so on. Um, when we get to the contribution side, we say you need to have a contribution policy. Uh, and of course, it's valid for that policy to be nope. <laughs> it can be anything. Uh, but a lot of companies, I would say struggle there, especially with making the right decision, because on one hand, you know, they're utilizing it, they might have improvements, they might be aware that forks are bad, but there's still that tremendous concern about intellectual property leakage and, you know, engineers going off track. And I was just wondering if you had some insights into how, how did you make companies like Juniper and so on em embrace contribution? Uh, how, did, how do we do that? Well, I'm going to leave Juniper out of the picture. That that wound is still too fresh to uh, to revisit that, frankly. Um, but in general, um, if there are a lot of concerns from companies, uh, I can stop fiddling with my glasses. Um, there are a lot of concerns from companies for um, for leakage of intellectual property of uh, stuff that they could potentially patent. You know, having yeah. that go out in the world and then voila, they can't patent it. Um, and of their developers just going and doing their own thing, right? right. And therefore losing all this, this potential intellectual property. Um, and what they don't understand, and that often these companies, as you say, they just put a hard no. It's like, no, you can't contribute upstream. Um, 
Right. What they don't understand are is that if you don't have some sort of an outlet for your developers, some sort of happy path, easy way for them to do this, they're going to do it anyway. And they're just going to go off and they're going to do it under their personal GitHub or their personal GitLab, and they're going to contribute and they're going to go signing CLAs, whether they are allowed to or not. And they're just gonna go do it because that's what we do in our culture, um, at least as developers. So, you have to come up with some sort of path for them to do that. You have to find some appropriate way for you to have oversight and them to contribute. So you ha there is a balance that you can uh, put in place there. And it can come from say whitelisting certain, um, right. certain projects, for instance, and, um, or, or I, I need to get used to not using those terms, I apologize, but um, having an approval list of projects to which you can um, contribute. But that requires you know what people are using. And what I find um, is either you have companies that know every single tiny little dependency all the way down to you know the small one-liner NPM modules, which are rarely right. licensed appropriately. But oh, that's a different matter. Um, or they have no clue whatsoever that what they're using, except for maybe the big stuff. Like, oh, we use Kubernetes and OpenStack and you know, the really big stuff but they don't know all that middle ground. Um, so you either know everything or you know nothing. And you can't really set up an appropriate policy if you don't know what's going on, if you don't know what's in that right. software supply chain. Um, and so you do have to kind of retroactively figure that out. Not only can this turn up some massive compliance problems, but it also can turn up some massive sustainability problems. When right. you find out that you have this one vital library that, for instance, um, converts files uh, to specialize between specialized formats. And that library, without it, your entire product falls over. Well, what happens if that project falls over? Because it has only a single maintainer. Well, that's, these are the things that you can turn up by knowing what is in your software supply chain and seeing which pieces of those chain are are load bearing, so to speak, and then making sure that they're shoring up appropriately so they don't break and your company falls over. And part of that, um, of shoring up those pieces in your software supply chain is contributing back, is yeah. making sure that your developers can help support this project in all of the ways that are necessary. Making sure you are putting your tech writers on that project, making sure you're getting people to, um, help support their infrastructure, uh, project management, security audits, right? There's so many different ways that your company can contribute that aren't simply throwing code at it and might potentially be a little easier for you as a company to swallow than donating your intellectual property in the form of code. But it's still incredibly yeah. important for making that project be uh, vital and sustainable in a way that it's not going to take your company out when it falls over because you've got this completely burned out maintainer out there who just can't even anymore. And so they walk away and they, they should, frankly, they, they should not take the abuse. It's uh, that I mean, one, one question that comes out of that is let's say you decide to have a contribution approach as a company um, and, and you have a huge list of projects that you're ingesting. Do you have any tips from your experience on how to pick the projects that are more likely to fall over or fail um, versus, let's say, projects that are probably fine that you, I mean, if you're not forking it, you don't need to contribute, say, Linux kernel. I mean, that's okay. <laughs> Do you have any tips then from your experience on, you know, picking the projects to adopt if you've got some leeway in this decision making? Because if you're faced with a thousand projects, you just think, well, you're yeah, uh, the ones that are used most often, I mean, if you do code profiling, it can be pretty, uh, it can really turn up the functions that are called most often and where are those functions coming from. Um, right. That's something that not a lot of projects or a lot, not a lot of companies do. It can be fairly intensive. Um, uh, it's something you would do say once a quarter or whatever. I don't know, it depends on your project or your product. Um, but that can really turn up the things that, uh, aside from you know potential code problems in your own proprietary code, it can also turn up the projects that you use most often and that you most rely on that you wouldn't otherwise have known, right? Um, 
we use this one particular class so often we call it thousand times a second but that one class depends on this one library and hey what is that library and just it requires a lot of manual work at that point you have to identify the things that are used most often which will depend upon your say ci cd or whatever you happen to use um for for your code uh but then you have to go and actually look at the product or the project and see yeah. is it maintained has it had a release recently has it had um fixed its dependencies as it uh does it take contributions from outside contributors um a lot of this you can determine by throwing the call uh throwing the repo url into cauldron.io which is a relatively new project from bitergia and it's a, uh, available for all open source projects and it's just it's just metrics just trying um, to find yeah cauldron.io is it free? It is totally free for any and all open source project. Nice. Um, it's also, I believe, open source. Um, Batergia open sources all of their product code. Yeah. So um, they do really good work. These are people who have PhDs in metrics and community who really know the sort of stuff that uh, will be important for communities. Um, they run the Chaos Project, C-H-A-O-S-S. -S. Uh, oh, well, they don't run it, but uh, they are very active in it. Um, but cauldron.io, you can just throw any repo in there and get a dashboard to see just how active that particular project has been. You know, you don't, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of this sort of crap. That is, um, that is so very useful. It is super useful. Um, it only launched in, I think, January, February. It's, um, in, it's in alpha mode, they say, but I'd say it's beyond beta at this point. It's uh, pretty rock solid. The UI has shifted a fair bit in the past couple months, but um, God, I've just found it to be incredibly useful for seeing how healthy a community might potentially be. Of course, it's just numbers. It doesn't tell the whole story, but it can give you a sort of baseline. It can give you some idea. Um, if you haven't seen any contributors or contributions in a long time, that could be a big problem. If the only contributors come from a single corporate entity, Yeah that could also be a potential problem, right? Um, that corporate entity might therefore, I don't know, relicense that piece right. of software under something that is not uh, compliant to the open source definition. And so therefore it's no longer open source and you can't rely on it. So that's yeah, we the saw sort that of thing you want to keep with uh, MongoDB recently, right? Yes, and uh, several Redis modules and there was an elastic search kerfuffle and 2018, 2019 were just the years of licensing nonsense. I guess it was, uh, you know, the tail end of unicorn time when these companies had been giving away their core product, which is kind of weird. You know, it's like you have an open source thing and that's actually your revenue product. Well, they, they probably it's, didn't put the revenue emphasis in the right place there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so absolutely. I found this to be pretty common lately, um, especially with open core, where people yeah. are taking um, licensing recommendations either from senior senior architects or senior developers, or even worse from VCs, um, yeah. and not going based on business need. Um, so yeah, of course, if you're basing if you're releasing your secret sauce, the thing that is really important to you and makes your company go and is your differentiator. If you're going to release that under a permissive or um, reciprocal license, and then somebody else right. comes along, takes that and creates a more compelling product offering. Well, yeah. that's your fault, frankly, that's not theirs. Right. And so you relicensing is potentially a very good idea from a business perspective, but maybe you shouldn't have released it in the first place because it's already out there. Now, if I recall correctly, and I was just looking on the web and I, I couldn't find it immediately, um, there was something similar to Cauldron that was acquired by Black Duck, and then they maintained it online for a while. But I was just looking at the Black Duck website and I can't find it. It was some kind of analytical tool on projects. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that one. It doesn't mean it didn't exist, just that, you know, I didn't know it. I, I will confess I'm also friends with a lot of the Pater. Bitergia folks. Oh yeah, I mean they're they're involved in OpenChain too. They're in the yeah, background. Of they're the great. Community. Yeah, 
fantastic. They both. That's the thing. They not only do they do really excellent work and support free and open source software in a really uh, great way. Thank Hans. It looks like it's OpenHub, OpenHub.net. Uh, both. Hans oh, 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 that's right. Yeah, that used um, to be um, yeah. a little bit higher profile, but it's kind of dropped off the radar these days. Ooh, yeah, I don't think I've ever used it. Yeah, Olo, it's... yes. That was acquired oh. by BlackDuck, I believe. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, thanks. That's for... correct. Yeah, the BlackDuck Black, Black acquired Olo. Yeah. So I'm trying to paste here. Yeah, so I'm going to open up the OpenHub website just for reference. So the one that's up there right now, we had a few new people join, like Sammy. Uh, Cauldron.io allows people to check the health of a project really quickly. And we were just talking about a more legacy um, item that allowed the same called, what's wrong with my input here? It's not working. You have a I'm going to have to reshare my screen. open somewhere? I guess so. No worries. I will reshare my screen. It's like turning my computer on and off. <laughs> Alrighty. So um, we were having a look at OpenHub, which was, uh, I'm sorry, Cauldron, which is a nice modern interface. And we were just recalling that there was another service in the past, um, Olo, which became OpenHub, uh, is now owned by Black Duck. Um, yeah. So these are ways to keep track of what you're up to. Um, so I, I guess now it's a you know, good time to ask, do you know of any complete train wrecks on contribution where a company tried to do it and it all went horribly wrong? And you know, perhaps you can't name names, but you know, I think everyone on this call is a friend of the idea of approaching contributions positive, the community's positive, but it, it'd be kind of useful to hear about where everything went wrong is a lesson learned. So um, obviously we'll not name names. Um, and this will be about releasing software yeah. rather than contributing. Uh, there was a company I was working with that, um, frankly, it had no one, no adult minding the development shop. There was no VP of engineering. There was no management whatsoever. Um, the entire dev team was outsourced to a country that was far flung from the home office. Uh, so they were just, you know, doing whatever they wanted. Um, and what they ended up wanting was using a non-standard version control system and a mono repo. And then they were told that you will now release the client side of the software as open source. Um, okay. And they decided they were going to do this in a highly convoluted way that required them to, oh, let me see if I can remember the details. Um, there were lots of sub-modules involved. There was lots of conversion scripts between their version control system and Git um, to get it into, uh, I think they were going to GitHub at the time, but they might've been going to Bitbucket. Yeah, it was Bitbucket actually. Um, hi Dundee, Dundee the kitty is on. <laughs> um, you know, you know the cat. <laughs> I do. He is awesome. Um, yeah, it, and it was just a nightmare uh, trying to extract this code and release it. And then the uh, development team did not understand that once you release the code, you have to maintain it as a community and build community. And it's not simply about getting it out there. That's yeah. not going to get you the benefits. That's just going to release your code. Um, and it just, it was just a nightmare the entire time. Um, I finally walked away, um, right. giving some very clear advice about perhaps you open sourcing this client is not your business problem. Maybe your business problem is you need to learn how to run a business, um, and get some better leadership in here and learn how to scale and learn how to actually do product development. Um, they had a really great product. They were quite successful because there was no one else in their niche doing that. Um, they, so there was a lot of great potential, but they, because of that, they had never bothered to learn how to do things properly. Right. And that unfortunately is what I see with a great number of startups. Yeah. And I mean, you're touching on something important there that a lot of the companies or governmental organizations or whatever that get burned around open source 
it's not the open source. It's, uh, it's not the, the strategic source. plan. Yeah, exactly. And that's why um, the very first question I end up asking at every single company I work with is what are you trying to accomplish? Right. And why? And I find that typically they don't know. Um, and that's <laughs> why, uh, I mean, I, I say I'm an open source business strategist, but really I'm a business strategist who deeply understands free and open source software. The focus really is on the business strategy side. Unfortunately, yeah. they tend to look on the free and open source software side. And so therefore, they shouldn't have to pay me for very expensive business strategy. But um, <laughs> that, that's one of many reasons to get out of freelancing in this world, frankly. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think uh, we probably most often these days hit problematic approaches to open source um, from smaller companies. Uh, startups in, let's say, the US are often quite difficult because they want to sell code and they don't realize that you, you're not really selling code nowadays if you're selling a product, not usually. Uh, and then it's smaller suppliers in Asia are often terrified of losing any competitive edge. So they might modify open source and then they're saying they're not going to give it to you at all. Um, and, and ultimately, they're, they're scared because they are looking for any differentiator they're at the bottom of the barrel. Um, do you have any suggestion for dealing with, let's say, those bottom of the barrel suppliers where they've got no money, they might have changed the driver to make the webcam work well, and now they desperately want to say that they made the driver, they own it. And uh, they, they confuse the fact that they might try to keep it proprietary with the fact that you might continue purchasing their cameras, which is not really what's going to happen, but it's quite difficult to get through that conversation. So any tips would be great. Oh, uh, without, the thing is it, my answer to almost everything, partly because I'm a consultant is it depends. <laughs> but, um, uh, it's, there's, it's going to be difficult to deal with that situation regardless. Um, right. And it really depends upon that particular company and what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, if they are simply forking something and maintaining it internally, and then you know, trying to pull and merge and pull and merge. Um, these are companies that typically haven't done the math yeah. to figure out that this is a really bad idea and this is costing me a hell of a lot of money to do. So maybe we should run that math and now let's figure out how to contribute upstream. So um, it's for those, it can be complicated. Um, often what I find in that sort of situation, the pushback doesn't come from leadership. The pushback yeah. comes from the developers. Um, and we have this, uh, unfortunately, we have this culture of developers now who really didn't, they weren't trained on open source appropriately. Um, it was like OSI stood up um, the uh, OSD and open source initiative and, you know, definition of open source 21 and a half, 22 now years ago. Um, and they, spread the word and here's the good word of open source and this is what it is and everybody at that time 22 years ago anyone who cared said yes we're on board and then coasted which is of course an open <laughs> simplification but just coasted yeah. in the meantime no, you know right. they're here and the entire tech industry is going here and so now we have all these people who learned about free and open source software via the telephone game right they heard from someone who heard from someone who heard from someone who heard blah 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 who 22 years ago saw bruce perrin speak at a university Right. And that's how they learned about free and open source software. So they don't actually understand it. They know that there's licenses um, and either they care a great deal about licenses, often way too much, or they don't care about licenses at all. And they're throwing their code up on GitHub and assuming that because you can see it, it's now open source. Right. And they don't understand the benefits of open source. They don't understand the community. They don't understand that open source is a team sport. Yes. To do it properly, you need multiple people and you need to collaborate and you need to work together. And that requires a hell of a lot more than simply, you know, an infra stack, some CI, CD, some code, and boom, you're done. It requires planning. It requires project management and release management and security audits and designers and UX and accessibility. And I mean, just there's so much that has to go into a successful open source project. Surprise, it's the same shit that goes into a free proprietary software project. Right. Um, there really isn't any difference here. It's just that we've been allowing the developers to go and run things. 
So um, they get very wrapped up in uh, emotionally in their code. Um, yeah. And so this is my code. I'm not going to release it. Or this is my code. Ooh, I'm going to release it all. I mean, there really isn't. It's hard to find that middle ground. But when you find those developers who do understand the middle ground, man, hold on to them. Get them <laughs> a good manager and help to raise them up because they will create so many more uh, great developers for your company. These are the people who named their price. Uh, yeah. One, one, one observation here, and we're running out of time, so we'll wrap it up around here. But one observation is that, strangely enough, where in the past it was like developers knew open source and it was bottom up and so on. Nowadays, you have business strategists who get open source, um, and your developers might not really. So it's, it's an interesting reversal of roles, right? Instead of desperately trying to tell your uh, business strategists that open source is important, it might be that the business strategists are running around trying to get the developers to stay on whatever the path is. Yes and no. Unfortunately, there aren't really a lot of uh, business strategists who understand both the business and the open source, um, right. which is why people like me are speaking with a lot of companies right now, um, because those are the smart companies that understand the legitimate business value that free and open source software brings to their company. Um, and they know that uh, they don't understand open source um, right. and that they need help to do it. It's just like, you know, when you're entering into, say, 5G and Edge, you might not have people who have on staff who have that knowledge. You have to hire them in. AI, ML, right? If you, you do machine learning and artificial intelligence right now, you can, those are the people who can name their price because there are lots of companies who need your skills, but that's because they don't have it internally, right? So um, the companies that have figured it out are starting to hire people like me. The companies that have not are going to continue to be a problem. Hopefully things like OpenChain will address this because OpenChain is going into the procurement cycle. And you know, as the expertise companies say to their suppliers, look, houses need to be in order, follow the ISO standard. Uh, open chain will be an ISO standard in September. Uh, hopefully it'll percolate through the industry, but it won't be overnight, that's for sure. Vicky, thank you so much for your time. It was just wonderful to have your insights. And everyone, don't forget the, um, the link is in the chat for Vicky's book, which is the only one on uh, contribution they're gonna find. So if you're looking at the open chain spec and you're somewhere around section five, which says have a contribution policy, this book is definitely a good place to have a, a good start. Thanks, Vicky. Um, okay, we're going to hand over the show to Amanda and the team at Open UK to talk about future leaders. Um, so we know that we've got great, let's say, seasoned leaders. <laughs> what do we do next? So, Amanda, over to you and your team. Jane, I think you've got a deck for us. I don't know if you. Yeah, I can or... share it. Do you want to share it? Can I drive if you share it? Well, at least yeah, to begin sure. with. Yeah. <laughs> Amanda, I'm surprised you didn't go objection, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, now showing the I'm now minus cat, Vicky. I'm sorry. No, no interest anymore. So uh, he's I'm, a fickle beast. Oh, he's a fickle beast, but I can still see him. So uh, I'm only going to speak for a very few minutes. And am I able to? Shane, do I have a move forward? No, it's just me, but you just Okay, okay, well, we're gonna be quite quick here. Do you wanna go straight to the second one? So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes introducing Open UK to give a little bit of context to Katie and Robert, who are the co-chairs of the Open UK Future Leaders Group, and they're gonna introduce themselves and talk about their own backgrounds and what they're doing, so I won't steal their thunder. Um, I think probably most of you have at least heard of Open UK, but you won't all have had any form of briefing on it. So uh, just a couple of minutes to do that with you. I think the organisations existed for a little while, but not really been particularly active until the beginning of this year. Uh, Andrew Katz is on the call. He's our pro bono GC. And along with Andrew, we appointed a board of a dozen people. Um, they come from not just open source software, but hardware and data also. And in January, we had a strategy meeting. Our next one is actually on Thursday. So a review after six months. But in that first strategy meeting, we set our vision, which won't be changing, which is to develop and sustain UK leadership of open technology. Now that sort of follows on from the fact that we, we really 
felt there was a moment in time to make Open UK into something because of Brexit. In some ways, I think the pandemic may cause other people in other countries to want to do something similar. And I've had a few conversations with people. We, we saw an opportunity where geographically, the people in the UK involved in Open are fairly dissociated. We tend to meet each other at international conferences and often we don't know our neighbours. Literally during the pandemic, I found that a lady I've been working with in an open data project lives a hundred yards from me, you know, out there and left. Um, and I had no idea. And um, this happens constantly. We don't know our geographic colleagues across open. So one of the things that we saw the opportunity to do was to bring everybody together as a cohesive community. And part of the reason for that was the timing with Brexit, but it is not isolationist. I really want to start by emphasizing that. It isn't the idea that we're just gonna create a little island of open source people. We are all going to continue and probably hopefully collaborate even more than we ever have across the globe. So to, to achieve that vision of developing a UK leadership in open technology, being software, hardware, and data, we're looking at three different pillars, and those are to build this visible, loud and cohesive community across the UK, to make the UK a great place to do open by influencing legal and policy, and then to pick up on exactly what Vicky was just saying. Um, it won't surprise you that I'm gonna say Vicky was so, so right, because she's always right, but building education and learning more about technology, particularly open technology, is really, really important. And one of the reasons it's important is we've seen this generation grow up and I think we have to be a bit accountable for them. Um, I think people call them millennials. I call them the post Linux generation because they were born after 1989 after the Linux kernel. And I'm sure Katie and Rob are going to have something to say to me about this. But they didn't go through the environment that many of us did where open was not something that existed. They didn't go through that choice. And for many of us, we made a conscious decision to become involved in open because we wanted something different from and more than proprietary. These people have grown up with open being a norm, but perhaps not understanding the where's and the why's and the how's. Um, so we, we have a duty, I think, to educate them, but also to educate primary, secondary and tertiary um, students as much as we can about open. And most of, at least in the UK, the education they get on technology doesn't have that emphasis. They may well be taught something like Python, but never be told it's open source or what open source means. So we've been working, Shane, do you want to flip to the next one? Um, we've been working locally to try and build this visible community. You can go one more, Shane. Actually, go back one. I'm good at it. We've been trying to build this visible community through things like events, which obviously have all gone horribly wrong now. Um, we've moved almost everything online. We have uh, Open UK Awards, which the nominations closed last week with 84 nominations, which I think in our first year is fabulous. Shane, do you want to go to the next one? So we have a whole week of events in October. One of those will be the awards giving not just prizes to individuals and organizations, but also to the kids involved in our competition. And I'll come back to them in just a second and focus on education just for a moment before I hand over. Um, in terms of influencing legal and policy, we have actually got a very established community of people like Andrew and Sammy and myself in the UK. I think somebody used the term seasoned. I'm not sure that I like seasoned. I think old is probably the word we're looking for. So we've realized we're all 40 plus, but we've been taken seriously pretty quickly as a group because we have the experience that goes with that longevity. And within months, we were invited into the uh, international trade folk, into the UK IT offices to talk to them about the trade agreements they're negotiating in a post-Brexit environment. Um, we have been collaborating with OSA and the European Commission on a report in the UK. That joint report should be out this week or next. And we are um, doing various projects where we're responding to any new legislation. But in, in having that um, gravitas in that group, we did realise genuinely that what we have is an environment where we have a huge amount of expertise in people over 40 and no obvious follow-up coming through. So we decided, Shane, can you do the next slide? We decided to deal with that in two ways. One is, of course, to focus on education. We started the year with a kids' competition. 
the kids competition has changed scope slightly and what we've done is distribute um, four gloves, four uh, mini moo gloves, which are kids version of Image and Heap software glove, music making glove. We've distributed those to four kids in each of the 47 schools participating in our competition. And we've spent the money that we were going to spend on uh, having kids travel all over the UK to come to a special event in London. We've spent that instead in creating an animated course of 10 lessons for high school students. Um, those 10 lessons, 10 minutes long each, we've been releasing them to the group weekly. The first one is actually narrated by Imogen Heap, the rest by a professional voiceover artist. Each of them has an activity for the kids and a learning about coding, but almost more importantly, and it doesn't destroy the fun, they have one minute of open source. So every time I hear it, it makes me smile from ear to ear, but in the first one, Imogen Heap explains what open source is. Um, that course is going to form the basis of a summer camp happening in August for 3,000 kids and we'll be distributing kits which are the software glove kit without the uh, micro bit. Shane, can you go forward a slide? Yeah, there we go. So that's the mini Moo glove kit you can see on the right there. It's based on a micro bit, but many thousands of kids have already got those in the UK. So we're going to be distributing the kit without that micro bit to 3000 kids in August. Any kid who's got the glove will be able to participate. The, the lessons will be accompanied by e-zines. There'll be two a week and they will be put up from early August. Shared Creative Commons, as I say, so anyone can participate. Um, Shane, do you want to go to the next bit? So as well as having this sort of focused education, we're looking at exams. You can keep skipping through, Shane. Um, let's see where we get to. Yeah, next one. There we go, handsome people. Um, so we are focusing on creating exams in an apprenticeship scheme. Again, the pandemic has impacted that. So it's likely to be early 2022 before we have those in place. But the idea is that we start to build a teenage community around open source across the UK. So we focused on high school kids. For younger kids, we're trying to access code camps and uh, coding classes that they already have, but in those to have an extra layer being explained to them. So from a very, very young age, they start to understand that things are open, they're on a license and vaguely what that means. And then for the grown-ups, as I've mentioned several times, our legal and policy group needed to reduce its, um, its gravitas somewhat and bring some fresh blood. We realised that and the, the way to do that was not to sort of force it, but to create this future leaders group. And that was designed intentionally to allow for an adult business focused learning space partly Vicky to cover some of the issues that you've talked about so that at least the business advisors and the wider grouping who are working with Open UK will understand the importance of business models and how the licensing interacts with it. And to tell you more about how we're going about making that future leaders group work, I'm going to hand you over to Katie and Rob. Thanks, Amanda. I think uh, an, an older kids group might have been an even better name for this rather than future leaders in some ways. I quite like that tagline, but the older kids group. Um, hi, everybody, and, and thanks for having us here to talk to you today. Um, my name is Robert Grinnells. Uh, I'm an associate technology solicitor at Phil Fisher, a law firm, a European law firm. And uh, I suppose a little bit about me and how, to, how did I come to this and how did I come to Open UK and uh, open source is a thing. I, I think of myself as a kind of a geek who can lawyer rather than a lawyer who pretends to geek. Uh, I am a technology lawyer and I try to pride myself on actually understanding or trying to understand how technology works and particularly open source. And I really got involved in Open UK because I use this stuff and I've wanted to find a way to contribute back. And yeah, as Amanda said, I grew up with this. I wish I was on that side of 89. I'm actually slightly the other side of 89 being an 88, but <laughs> I still I remember growing up and <laughs> struggling to use Ubuntu. Uh, it's a good memory with my dad when I was uh, struggling to get off of Windows XP. Um, I guess my coding skills, I kind of leave a lot to be desired. So I'm hoping my kind of legal uh, knowledge that's growing at least <laughs> and being part of Open UK and the groups like this uh, might help to contribute back to this uh, wonderful community. And as I said, I'm one of the co-chairs of this group. Katie, do you want to say a few words about yourself as well, how you came to this? Yeah, sure. So I'm Katie Gibson. I'm an associate in the commercial IPIT team at Bristow's. Um, it's a law firm based in London and I practice across IP, IT, data um, within the technology sector. Um, I came to it slightly differently that intellectual property has always been 
absolutely fascinated, like completely fascinating to me. Um, and I was kind of drawn towards being more interested in the open side because I think it's a good comparison and getting to kind of understand the whole concept of IP across um, proprietary IP and also open, um, I think it's really fascinating. And particularly in the current climate, I think um, the response to COVID has obviously been fascinating in terms of how people have um, tried to work together and open, um, open their IP. Um, so I'm also, I'm actually the other side of 89, so I am, I'm actually a post 90s baby. So. Between the two um, of us, we work across the planet. <laughs> exactly. <good. laughs> exactly. So um, I'll hand back to Rob. Thanks. So, yeah, we are the co chairs of uh, the Open UK Future Leaders Group of the Legal and Policy Committee. And basically, what do we do? We try to facilitate and help run and organise the Future Leaders Group to try to encourage collaboration. And uh, we work together with the Open UK Legal and Policy Committee to do that. Um, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, Shane get our faces off the screen <laughs> you get the live version anyway so what is the the future leaders group um so we are as Amanda said we're a collection of individuals we're open and in interested in open technology including open source software we also have a wider gamut across open hardware and open data as well it's got a range of people it's not just lawyers having had two lawyers as be the coaches it is not just lawyers there are people who work across all the technology ip outsourcing, procurement, data, property, coding, and innovation. Uh, it does include some private practice lawyers and in-house counsel. Perhaps, unfortunately, some people might say, I don't know. Um, but we all work in technology sector and related fields. So, and part of what we want to do is we want to try and say, make, as Amanda said, make the UK a great place for open tech. Uh, we want to learn about it and help to spread the word, uh, work together and help build those communities and also the satellite the support communities to perhaps the core technology group of people who are involved in open tech um, and sort of broaden and widen participation in open as a whole uh, and yeah as i said it's not just lawyers um, we do have a broad range of backgrounds of people who are introduced and involved in the thing uh, across legal policy governance data strategy and privacy so yeah um, next slide shane please so what are we doing and um, what is kind of our purpose? We're trying to unite and introduce future leaders to each other uh, and also to existing leaders uh, or very old kids, perhaps is the other term to use, in open. Uh, so we are, as I said, supporting Open UK's Legal and Policy Committee and their aims and their wider range of activities. Um, but we're trying to create networks and communities uh, to connect people and support them on their journeys to, to open. Um, we're trying to bring people together. Uh, there's various initiatives, which Katie will talk about a bit more in a minute. Um, but it's to come to ensure that we continue to drive forwards awareness and participation for the next generation of people in open. Uh, there's a wealth of knowledge out there, I think an awful lot of it on this call as well, um, which we have to pass on to the next generation so that uh, people understand what has been done. I think exactly as Vicky was saying, people understand what has been done, what the challenges were and what there is still to be done. What are the next challenges that we need to face? So. Uh, we're also quite important in trying to get people to use open. Uh, one of the things we do is uh, we use, as Open UK, we use and promote the use of open source projects. And um, where we can, the majority of our cool tooling and products that we use are open. And we feel one of the best ways for us to promote the philosophy is to use it. Um, we try not to favour any one project or solution, of course. Um, we use a wide range of them. But it's a good way to coach and discuss it when we're using it and uh, have actually used it ourselves as well. So. Uh, that's it from me for now. And I think over to Katie on the next slide to talk a bit more about our projects that we've got going on. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. Um, so, yeah, as part of these activities, as um, we've said, we kind of support the work of the Legal and Policy Committee for Open UK. Um, and we learn from them as well, as we've, as Amanda touched on. Um, so we're involved in various areas of the committee's work and kind of whittling it down to three cornerstones of what we do and what our activities and what we get up to uh, is around education reviewing and events so on education since march we've had training sessions every friday um, from people from around the world focusing on all different aspects of open um, it has involved a huge different range of speakers who have had different roles in various organizations and who have extensive experience in dealing with open source from various different angles and since its inception as well. Um, and these have ranged from digging into the history of open source to discussing open source license types, problems that causes, practical situations, practical issues. Um, and so that's been really interesting to see all different types um, of open. Um, it's included sessions on open and trademarks and patents, 
well um, and the consideration of open technologies in procurement which brings me on to the next slide if that's okay Shane please so reviewing so we're currently conducting a review of public procurement terms for public bodies in the UK so off the back of obviously all our um, fantastic training for the past few months um, it was been over to us to look at these public procurement terms um, and how they their, by their approach and their process what would how could we develop that um, and level the playing field for open and proprietary solutions um, and basically just making sure that the approach and the process that these terms and you know, kind of how um, these public bodies go about procuring technology solutions um, can make sure that both proprietary solutions and open solutions are considered side by side. So the process of the review has seen the members of the Future Leaders Group work together um, and independently to go through the procurement terms of various different public bodies in the UK um, to work through basically how to address and reflect how the playing field could be levelled um, across these, these terms. Um, this is kind of not looking at uh, specific drafting amendments of the terms, but looking as on a whole, kind of across the board, across all the terms, what could be changed, but also specifically looking um, at the certain at the different sets of terms themselves and how the approach could possibly be um, developed um, with proprietary open solutions both in mind. So as Rob mentioned, the group brings together people from a variety of different backgrounds, which mean the, means the review can be really interesting in terms of people's different various experiences. Um, both practical with legal and how what they bring to looking at the terms and what angle they, they look at them from. Um, so it will ultimately lead to a recommendations report so we can collate all of our different responses um, and provide a consolidated report with all, what we would suggest um, would be kind of a good approach. It's going to involve further input as well from the future leaders group but also from the legal and policy committee itself. Um, and we can work hand in hand with them to make sure that this report kind of captures um, the response that Open UK would like to deliver in terms of around the approach and process um, of these different public bodies to technology procurement um, and how they consider proprietary and open solutions on a level playing field. So please have the next slide, Jane. Finally, um, events. So following this specifically off the back of the review, there will be um, uh, opportunity for us as future leader groups for Open UK to actually discuss a report with our counterparts um, at kind of similar level um, within these public bodies, um, hopefully involving a social element as well, maybe <laughs> probably online rather than face to face, uh, as we'd originally hoped, um, which will be a good opportunity to discuss um, what, what we've done uh, and what they might think of it, or um, and again, kind of like their angle as well. Um, and meanwhile, the training sessions um, that we mentioned before um, will continue into the autumn and take on a more commercial angle. Um, so that um, is it for now. But thank you very much for listening. And if anyone's got any questions, please do shout. It might be worth mentioning that Shane's going to join us. We've already had two sessions on Open Chain, one from uh, Sammy on an intro to open chain and then one from andrew katz on m a and open chain the sessions are all recorded and available in our uh, past events section on openuk.uk but we're about to launch a youtube channel as well oh, with wow. um all they're the all available leaders. they're all yeah, available they're all <laughs> available and what's really nice about them we talked about doing a, a podcast before this all kicked off and we never got around to doing it and actually, somehow we're recording people talking about the history of open. And just, it's almost like a set of memoirs from us old folk. <laughs> but it is, it really is. So uh, it's, it, there's a nice sort of sense about it. I think they're good sessions and we've had all sorts of different people on it. One of the other really nice things is that it, it's very quickly demonstrated, although we've had international speakers, We've had a lot of UK based or UK people and actually there are a huge number and we have these sessions now booked all the way through to November, room for a few more November, December. Um, I did ask Vicky actually some time ago, but for her, the 12 noon from the West Coast in the US doesn't work very well. 
doesn't love us enough to get up that early. No. <laughs> the initiatives that you're running are, um, you know, obviously Take the very slides down, Shane. <laughs> what, what is interesting is how on earth are you and your team doing so much? I mean, it's very prolific. It's, it's a lot. Um, is it a lot? How are we doing so much? <laughs> <laughs> They're probably scared to answer that one. Um, how are we doing so much? I think everybody's busy. Everybody's committed. We've got a lot of people involved. Katie, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think we're, I mean, for, for Rob and I, it's um, definitely, I think of the word, kind of complements our day, our day job. Um, so in terms of that we're often like dealing with um, on various different um, aspects of kind of different terms and dealing with mm -hmm. procurement um, for various different companies. So it's just kind of quite interesting to have the opportunity to then think through at a different level and actually be part of the review. So I think that aspect is that you might be doing something else and think I've had, I've had that, that you're doing something else and then have a brainwave. Um, so it's kind of you, you, fit, you fit it in <laughs> with the day job as well. Yeah, I think also if you look at the span of Open UK, not just at the, the Future Leaders Group, we have a whole team of people working in our learning committee who are educationalists in the main. We've got a whole team of volunteers in the legal and policy. There are 16 people in the Future Leaders Group. So they're big groups of people dividing work up amongst themselves and then collaborating. So it just happens to be these sort of very clear, distinct pillars. You know, they, there's a, a bunch of different folk doing each different thing. So, yeah, Shane, we probably are quite prolific, but it, it's, um, it's coming from lots of folk. Well, I have to say uh, thank you so much for sharing on this. We're going to pause here to see if anyone's got some questions. Um, Big thank you as well to Jerry for posting in the uh, event schedule for us in the chat. All right, if there's no further questions, thank you very much indeed, Robert. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Amanda. Uh, so we're going to wrap up webinar seven around here. We're a couple of minutes ahead of schedule on the hour. Um, so. If there's one thing I would recommend, it's uh, wear a mask. It's working for Japan, it's working for Taiwan, it's working for Korea. Here's a good mask, a knowledge transmitter. This is from a, a cartoon that's worth reading online. Um, it's, it's obviously not gonna turn to normal anytime soon. The US has reported um, record cases three days out of the last five. But certainly, we can expect our sector to operate as normal. Um, as you can see, Open UK is, Open Chain Project is. We'll continue to refine how we do our online work to make sure that everyone can collaborate nice and easily. Um, you can expect some announcements from the Open Chain Project in the near future. Um, not about our webinars per se, which continue on a regular schedule, but you can expect us to be trying to collaborate with other parties to deal with broader subjects around open source. So we'll, we'll work on having events there. And of course, we've uh, got things coming up. I think it's 25th of September. I'm collaborating with the Open UK webinars and uh, I'll be announcing some more webinars over the next few weeks. Thank you everyone for your time. I hope you had a, an interesting webinar. Thank you very much to Vicky for sharing knowledge about lessons learned, uh, Robert and Kathy for sharing knowledge about the future to come, and uh, to all of those who are making it happen, especially Amanda. Take care all, and have a good day. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank Thanks everyone, bye-bye.